No? Okay, I'm gonna go now. Good luck, guys. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, you could start now, Brida. Okay. Where is the honest fool? Where is the open soul? Where is the simple smile? A the word or two from the passing stranger as we rest a while. I'm uh, Brie the Larkin, and uh, this is a Galway 2020 Big Small Towns Big Ideas. And I had plenty of help getting this together, and I want to present now co host this evening of Ethical Eats, Rita Wild. Hello, everybody. You are so welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you so much, Brita, for yeah, inviting me to, to co host this, and I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Kieran Allen from UCD. Kieran is a sociologist, professor of sociology, and he's here to give us the global and international context of what's going on with our soil. And we have Leslie Dwyer, delighted that Leslie could join us. Leslie's a soil expert, and he's here to give us the dirty detail about what what the problem is and how that might be addressed or fixed. Um, you'll see Hazel Hurley. Yeah, you can see the diagram from Hazel. Hazel's here with us and she's going to be sketching throughout the webinar. So at the end of it all, we're going to have a beautiful little image or picture of this event as a keepsake. Laura is our chat monitor. The lovely Laura Lavelle is in the chat, minding us all and keeping us all good. Please do chat away in the chat and if you have particular questions use the question and answer box we'll not hello Sinead we and this Sinead Moran who is our farmer here um, to talk to us about what what she's doing um, now with the raised hands we'll not generally use the raised hand if you have a question pop it in the Q&A um, and we'll come to it we, this event is live captioned. So you'll see down here, you've got a little button that says closed captions. If you click on that, our live captioner, Michelle, is in there typing away with everything that's being said. And it's very interesting also to follow that, um, even if you don't need to use it. Of course, we have Brida Larkin. So Brida, comedian, uh, extraordinaire, farmer's daughter, um, an activist. Mm. We have Sarah, who you'll see that there. Sarah's our tech, and she's making sure everything's there, Kalmuski, and she's making sure everything runs behind us. We also have Elaine Feeney as a guest that you saw on the poster, but Elaine's, we're using a recording of Elaine because sadly she wasn't able to join us live tonight. So that's the, now, I'm wondering if I have any more housekeeping. Um, yeah, during, throughout the event, we'll be popping things into the chat, like people's email addresses or websites, and also the donor box. So we'll put a link in for donor box. And if you like, 
you can make a contribution to Talib Bio, which will be used for further education videos. Mm -hmm. And that link will get popped into the chat as we go. So I think without further ado, I am going to ask Brita to come here now and tell me, what is the story with the land is on drugs? How did that happen? Well, hi, Rita. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here tonight with us all. Well, this was, uh, you know, I mean, two years ago, go with 2020 and got the funding. I thought, right, go with 2020, 10, 10, 20, fell on the floor. I'm going to do a big agricultural event about synthetic nitrogen, 10, 10, 20. And because I grew up on a farm myself and I, I remember well shaking manure and all that and never really passed much of a marks on it. It was just about growing grass. I mean, I'm a farmer's daughter and grew up, you know, in the, in the rural Ireland, you know, we had plenty of things to keep our minds occupied, naming cows, you know, we had all different types of cows, like long tits, short tail, dog hater, rogue, you know, they all suited different personalities as children. And uh, we had a nice idyllic uh, country living. My father raised six of, and mother raised six of us on the farm. Um, so we had um, th lovely things we'd like to do. We used to sit in the wall and, and watch the cow and the bull make love. That was one of the favorite things to do really. And, you know, I used to play school with the calves. Remember I, I was, my Ella was into teaching them how to read and things. And I liked to do to be a PE with them. So I'd uh, have the, as one calf now, I took a particular interest in very athletic. So I let him run around and he'd jump a little fence and I'd make the fences higher as, as, the, as the months went on. And then when he got let out of the shed after a while and, you know, in the springtime that he just raced and he cleared like a six foot ditch and uh, Daddy was going mad. But I was secretly very, very proud of my protege. So it's great. Farm life is great fun. You know, I, I, I took a lot of interest. I'm doing the green search right now and, and at the moment. And I had a lot of questions and I ended up meeting Tal of Bio and learning lots from different farmers there. So I, I took an interest in soil and went up and did a, a course, a little day of learning about soil. And I saw an image under the microscope that Sarah I pull up for me there because it really struck me. And this is how it all kind of catalyst for this uh, event that we're here now. So I poked my friend beside me and I, I looked at the image and it was a grass root under the microscope a grass root of grass that's been treated with 10, 10, 20. And uh, I poked my friend, I said, the land is on drugs because it looked exactly like an IV line. So there's a little bit of it there now. And uh, so that's kind of how it all started. So I've been really interested. I I read like about, uh, you know, there's a one, one straw revolution is a, is a book that I was saying to daddy, we should, this is the natural farm, we should get back to, and I think Sarah's going to pop that up as well, because I, I was trying to pronounce the name today, and uh, Masinyobo Fuka, yeah, Fukoya, I'm probably saying it wrong, but one straw revolution, it's like I said, daddy, it's do nothing farming, and he's like, oh, you'd love that, all right, do nothing farming, so um, yeah, he's, uh, so what I find this, an extraordinary read and it's, it's like it was written in the 40s and it's more relevant today than ever so I'd uh, that's definitely a bible for me so I continued my soil journey and and how, how what, can, what can be done and I met a, a great man who's going to come and talk to us now in a second Leslie Dwyer from APS BioAg and just you know because it, it is like the, there's a, from seeing the evidence that uh, the land's on drugs and what can be done, the overproduction of farm, and, and it just seems like we're going in the wrong direction. So I want to bring Leslie now to have a chat with us to tell us, because so, Les, being a soil expert as you are, um, can you <laughs> explain a bit more about what it's actually doing to the soil? Okay, well, just to clarify, Brida, I'm definitely not an expert. I, um, I, <laughs> I work in the area of soil and soil biology, and... Um, I don't, it's, soil is so diverse and so complicated. Uh, there's, I don't think any one person could be classed as an expert. We all have our areas of uh, expertise, I suppose. But uh, as farmers and as pr food producers, I suppose we're in a system where um, we're producing predominantly milk and beef in Ireland. Um, we are in, uh, in a system where we are using chemical fertilizers. And over the last 
number of decades. Um, our whole system has followed down the, the, I suppose, the chemical route. And really, there's three aspects to soil. There's, there's the physical, there's the chemical, and there's, there's the biological. And before there was chemistry, our forefathers knew about the biology. They mightn't have known what we know today, but they knew what worked, and they knew how to get crops and get vegetables and get, um, get grass to grow because they didn't have the chemistry back then. And they use what, what was at their disposal in, in terms of farm air manure, etc., in terms of composting farm air manure. And I suppose chemistry came along and chemical nitrogen came along and um, it was easy. It was an easy thing to do. It was, it was an easy thing to go out with the bag and apply it. And uh, as time has gone on, the whole system has developed around applying fertilizers. And we've completely forgotten about the biological aspects of soils. And really, from an Irish context, if you look at just some of the basic science that's there, Brida, um, our, our soils on average have about 600 to 700, 800 parts per million of phosphorus in our soils. And we would need any one year, we would need probably about uh, 7 to 10 parts per million. So we have up to 40 or 50 years worth of phosphorus locked up in our soils. Um, but, but we do apply some phosphorus fertilizer. When it comes to nitrogen, and if you look at our soil organic matter, and these are figure, figures from uh, Tagus themselves, um, there's anything up to 7,000 kilos of nitrogen per hectare locked up in our organic matter. And depending how well, how active your soils are, how biologically active, how well structured they are, which, which intertwine with each other, about 2% of that gets released a year. So on average, about 74 to 220 kilos of nitrogen can get released per year if our soils are active enough. But yet still we put on bag nitrogen. Um, and research that came out of Rottenstead Institute in the UK in 2019, they have some of the oldest, longest standing uh, grassland plots in the world. I think they're going back 148 years. And, and they, with the advances in science, they went and they looked at the plots where no fertilizer were ever applied and compare them to the plots where fertilizer slurry, et cetera, had been applied for the last 148 years. And um, what they found was where they had been applying chemical fertilizer, the biological species numbers dropped. Um, but not alone that, the genetic makeup of those biological species were changed by the fertilizer. So what we've done in essence is we have reduced the number of bacteria that can naturally fix nitrogen for us. And we've also released uh, the, the number and the genetic makeup of bacteria that can release phosphorus and recycle phosphorus, but also fix carbon. So we're on a, we're on a dangerous trajectory in terms of the continued use of fertilizer and not bearing in mind what effect it has on the overall aspect of soil, particularly the biology. And that's something that we need to address. That's something that we need to um, educate ourselves and educate the people that are using the fertilizer and the people that are advising the farmers to use the fertilizer. So I think we need to take a step back and uh, gather all the information and um, put our best foot forward afterwards because we have gathered a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of information in the last 10, 20 years as to how we can reduce the level of fertilizer we're using but maintain output. So can I come on there, Leslie? Um, thanks a million for that. Just for, you know, for, the, for the people here, the um, participants here, we know absolutely nothing about soil. So to, I'm gonna back us up a small bit. Am I right in saying that soil is a living thing and that it is chock full of bacteria and other microorganisms and that those, those microorganisms in the soil are what work with the plants? Yes in order that the plants can uptake nutrition and in order that, and in fact, that the plants themselves are nutritious for the, for the animals or people that eat them. Yeah. 
Would yeah. that would that be right? That's a really good synopsis, Rita. Yeah, that's and correct. And then to say that that so that bacteria and that life in the soil is crucial to the production of food. Yet, what you've just explained is is the use of artificial fertilizers is having a devastating impact on the soil biology. Would that, would that be fair? Well, what it's doing, uh, what it's doing, Rita, is it's reducing the level and they have found that it has changed the genetic makeup of some of those species. That's, um, that's, that's worrying now. That's worrying um, because it's happened in 50 years. Um, so that's why I think we need to do more research. We need to inform ourselves. We need to figure out ways of... We're always going to need some fertilizer. And I think there's a level above which um, we should not go. Um, but we need to find ways of reducing what we're using. And we need, we need to uh, put more money and put more resources into researching the biological aspects of soils. And because really they're human health, animal health, plant health, soil health, they're all linked. Everything is linked. And uh, it's only now that uh, doctors and um, and researchers are realizing the power of, of the biology in the human uh, gut. Mm. The same applies for animals, the same applies for plants, the same applies for soils. Mm -hmm. um, bi biology uh, is, I think, probably one of the greatest unknowns and probably the one facet of Mother Earth that we can tap into to improve our general health and our general well-being. And uh, absolutely, the biological side of soils in terms of the bacteria, the funguses, viruses are a crucial aspect of soils. And um, um, there's a whole litany of the soil food web that we need to inform ourselves about and that we need to take, get a grasp of and get a grasp of quickly so that we, we can make informed decisions about how we grow our crops. And Leslie, I, I have heard that globally, soil is being lost at an alarming rate. And I've heard, I don't know what the figure is now, but something like we've only got 50 harvests left if we don't intervene to stop the destruction of soil. Do you think Irish farmers are aware of this? Are they aware of just how precarious this, this is? Simple answer is no, Rita. Um, the situation isn't as dire in Ireland as it is in other countries. Um, in, in arable systems, um, soil loss and soil erosion is a massive issue. Um, in Ireland, because of our grassland, it's less of an issue. It still is an issue. Um, in arable systems, uh, in our traditional plough till so it is an issue. Um, there is steps being taken to address it, uh, but uh, I don't think enough resources is put into education and education about soil and protecting soil and protecting soil health. Absolutely. Well, I've been there and I'm doing the green cert and, you know, there really is, while we do learn about the soil web, we also are told in our books to continuously use synthetic nitrogen. So really, I think we were discussing before that they need to be retrained, really. Because I know my father, the reason I started thinking something was changing, because he said when he was young, he'd shine a light on the grass, shine a torch, and he'd hear the thunder and sound of all the earthworms going down underground. But it's pretty, it's not, it's pretty silent at the moment out there. But thanks so much, Leslie, because I'm going to bring in a, a farmer that really inspired me now, uh, who's running her own micro dairy in, 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 in uh, Ballyhonas, County Mayo. She's a very inspiring person because I brought my father to see her farm, to see her do the methods of the mob grazing and you know she's a circular economy so welcome please Sinead Morn of Blin Bui Farm all the way from Mayo. Yay! 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 <laughs> so Sinead tell us a bit about your farm and uh, oh yeah national farming for I like your award back there farming for nature ambassador yeah my backdrop College no member <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah tell us particularly about your soil Tell us all about your lovely soil as well, Sinead. <laughs> uh, like, as Leslie said, I think it's hard for anyone to be a soil expert, and I'm definitely no soil expert. But I can tell the life in our soil just from, I suppose, what's above the soil. 
because if you think of the soil as your your foundation, then you have what's above it. Then you have, in our case, what grazes it, and then you have what we take off that grazing animal. And um, so we're really, really lucky that the farm that we now farm was never farmed intensely. So it was in, uh, there wasn't synthetic nitrogen in it in I don't know how long. So not only was there no synthetic nitrogen, but because we didn't farm it between when uh, my partner inherited it and before we put livestock on it, um, it had gotten a serious amount of rest. And that has brought this mass of, of biodiversity into it. But what we did notice was that as we begin to graze it, and we began to manage it, as Breda mentioned, through mob grazing and holistic management, that kind of thing. We actually noticed that we were helping to actually spread the diversity as well. So in the first year, we had cow slip in one corner of the field. By year three, we've had it in, in a, another area of the field. So the cows are helping to spread that as well with what we graze. So the Dave Beecher, the, the Dave Beecher, the soil preacher, has already mentioned them. He always says dig a hole and smell the soil. Um, and yeah, we dig some holes and it smells good. So I think, as I said, from, from above it, you can see that there's obviously good life below. You're on mute, Rita. Yeah, we did. Rita has a burning question here, Sinead. <laughs> I have, that is a story of my life is not forgetting about. You're really bucking the trend, Sinead, because you're small scale dairy farming. And it's all about huge scale dairy farming. And Brita tells me you have a lovely story about trying to buy some equipment for your dairy. Uh, yeah, so when we, um, when we were deciding that we wanted to, you know, we were farming as a suckler farm part time. Um, and while we were still making more than the average sucker farmer because we weren't using synthetic inputs and we were able to control that end of it, we couldn't control the, the, the output price. So we started to look into different options and we were meeting loads of different farmers doing things differently. And we were talking with MJ's family and they came up and they told us the old stories about the Glambui, which was the butter fields, et cetera, et cetera. So we decided we'd go with this idea of being a micro dairy and that we'd milk cows the old school way and we'd bottle and sell direct. So the first thing is to research how, what, you know, where will I get a milk machine? What are the prices like? What's the budget? And I started to ring around for a, a, a four unit milking unit. And the first place I rang, the guy answered and he was like, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, look at, we're uh, new to dairy. So I don't know much. And he's like, that's no bothers. I'm here to help you, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, sound, look at, I'm looking for a quote for a four unit milking parlor. And he was like, a 40 unit parlor. And I was like, no, 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 a four unit parlor. And he's like, four. And I said, yeah, four. And he's like, one, two, three, four. That's it, four. I was like, yeah. And he's like, uh, geez, I'll have to get back to you on that. He never got back to me. Like, it was just not worth it in his case. So, yeah, so we, we, we got a second half one of a farmer who's actually going bigger. So we, we kind of win one on that side of it. Like we're, we're booking the trend purely because we are small scale and to be the kind of the way agriculture is right now at our scale, we have to control input. We also have to control output if we want to make a sustainable living. Um, but I don't think that small is always just the beautiful. Big farms have such potential to be just as beautiful if they're supported, I suppose, to farm differently. Um, whether that's through education or cap support or et cetera, et cetera. You know, big isn't always bad. It can be great. Like. That's that's interesting because you don't hear that much, should I? You know, you hear that big is bad and small is better. So how could big be okay? How, how is big okay? I think it depends. Like there's some great examples out there. Um, I see in the comments, the Danu project has been mentioned, but there's also the Bride project, which is a great example of um, the more intensive dairy farmers who are taking steps to bring biodiversity back onto their farm. Um, and while for, for the real strong environmentalists like myself, 
you'd be kind of like, go on, you can do better, you know, you can get there. But it's a step in the right direction. And I think when it's farmer led, um, that's the right way to do it. They're, you know, they're the guys that who are building the transition to change, who are showing the transition to change. You know, we're kind of at the end of it where this is what we're doing. This is our farm. We're already uh, selling direct. You can buy from us direct. And then you've got the other guys who are caught within a system and you've got stuff like the Bride Project showing them different ways that they may be caught in this way, but they can do different things on their farm to support um, biodiversity on their farm. Because at the minute, it's all about, you know, uh, output at, at, at all costs. <laughs> Can you, so today, can you just talk just a little bit about access to finance? Because I know, when you, you know, because you're a micro dairy, not your big dairy, the difference is they do get access to finance more easily. I know it's debt, but at the same time, you know, to set up like something you're like, my, your micro dairy to set it up it does take a bit of capital. So how just talk a little bit about how you manage that. Uh, yeah, capital. It's... Um... I think any small farmer that you speak to, that uh, our scale is our hinder uh, for so many things in the conventional sense, but it's actually a blessing in disguise, I think, as well. But yeah, capital, when we uh, went to the bank and we applied for a farm loan, um, I had put, I had to do a, a business plan and I had to do a spreadsheet and I had put in a spreadsheet for 10 cows. And when they rang me, they thought I was missing a zero. And then when I told them I wasn't missing zero, this was for 10 cows, they told me that my numbers were low, that the cows would be doing a lot more. And I said, no, we're milking short horns. Of course, being too honest, I was like, no, we're milking short horns and they'll milk a little bit less, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, um, they basically told us that they had a template for dairy and we didn't fit that template. So they wouldn't put us in as a, as a standard farm loan. We were deemed too high risk then and they wouldn't actually lend to us. So it was through microfinance, family, and our own savings and time <laughs> that we have gotten to where we are. Like, so we've been lucky. Yeah, thanks for that, Shane. Because we're going to do a break for art about, and we're going to show Annie Oaks. But just tell people <laughs> how much trees you planted on your farm yourself, because you, you you also incorporate the agroforestry, don't you? Uh, I wouldn't call us agroforestry. Just... I'd love to be agroforestry, and then mm -hmm. sometimes I look at the fields and I kind of go, oh. Um, like our biggest field is three acres. Okay. So, and either side of that three acres is a big thick, uh, whether you deem it a hedgerow or a tree line, that's a debate for another day. But anywhere we have gaps, we plant in trees. So for the last three years in a row, we've done uh, the Trees in the Land Initiative, which is a fantastic initiative. It's so affordable to basically get trees on your land. But we've planted in 250 native trees over the last uh, three years. Um, and our intention going forward now is to plant more of them and also to give the opportunity for other people to plant, say, if they want to plant bigger native trees into our land and things like that. So that for people who are conscious and maybe want to offset carbon or just want to plant a tree, we're here and I've got gaps in the hedge. So more than happy to put trees in. Gaps in the hedge. But that's that's what women in farming was growing up, wasn't it, Sinead? Yeah, pretty much. My role was standing in a gap. And in the gap. <laughs> yeah. Roll of women. Thanks so much, Sinead. Uh, it's great to talk all evening. But again, if you want to know more about your farm, you're great on Instagram, Glenbuy Farm. Follow them on Instagram because it's great. See a lovely, lovely farm production. And uh, thanks to me, Sinead. So we will. We'll have a break for art and and, and show the video because this Galway 2020 is funded. Uh, I did a rap and uh, a music video. So you can sit back and enjoy now and have a, a for love trees. Roll it there, Sarah. The Agwitch, it's Bridget. Bridget. Keeper of the land. We need to plant more native trees. Respect your elders and your elders. It's Bridget and her garden hose. Oh. Let me tell you about ash trees. 20k cut a year just for her leave. Fina fall like my rhymes if be acting tight. Made a rash decision with zero foresight. Important trees from across the seas. Bringing ash to the knees now they're all diseased. Why you mad Fina fall? We just spit the facts. Because you being cheap brought in ash die back. Scott's five. She's five. Tall and majestic. Oh yeah, she's Celtic. A forest can start in you. All we need is 
Cause I spade some seeds in you Hawthorne, she's a witch's tree Full of magic, healing and mystery In the middle of the field she stands alone No one dares cut her down cause they're turned to stone Adios, adios, adios That statement shouldn't be a blasphemy. Sit in the cabaret and plant some trees so the next generation can breathe. Willow, can you go? 2%. Willow, can you go? 2%. Oh, the IFA won't let me be. Let me be me. So let me say they're trying to shut me down while planting trees. But the world is empty without the trees. What's up, Quill Child? We're sick of you. Planting non native trees like sick. Tons of glyphosate killing good bacteria. You're not fungi, you're diphtheria. Blackthorn, the mother of the woods, shopping thorns and spikes to protect your goods. Are you slow? Or birdies flavor your gin? Think of that next time you be drinking. Her branch, her sap. She's pussy, she's crack. She's willow, use me for biomass. Compass me like an elder tree. Why not plant trees? I asked the women. Let's plant trees. And the women said, well, we would plant trees, but we don't know how. And that started the whole story of let's learn how to plant. And we called the foresters because to plant a tree, you need a diploma. I said, well, you, I don't think you need a diploma to plant a tree. Birch, it's cold in here. There must be CO2 in the atmosphere. Are you nuts? been live on uh, 10 to 20 and the floor would have blew the blue band the floor uh, 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 blew it into the next hemisphere so yes great and uh, that was uh my response to learning there's only three percent native trees and of course forestry is another massive we could have a massive webinar on that too but um really i want to since we're kind of move on to the next break because of course put the culture in agriculture and sort of being creative with you know we've grown up in farming and grown up with land and grown up in rural Ireland and all that and how it shapes your personality and your future really so I Lane Feeney is a, a poet that a lot of people would know now from Galway from Athenry a farmer's daughter and really connected and uh, you know with each other because of that and uh, she had a poem with 10 10 20 in it so I pre-recorded this so we can uh, enjoy Elaine Feeney and uh, talking to me about her poetry and how it influenced her work. So, yeah. So roll it there, Sarah. Thanks. For and just to say to the chat, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. The land is on drugs. And um, huge thanks, Rita, for inviting me. We we met some time back. And we had a good chat about being farmers' daughters, I suppose. And more than that, um, I'm also a poet and in my earlier years as a child, I sort of looked at the at the farm in a totally different way. I, I wanted sort of nothing to do with it or or, you know, growing up in the countryside, it seemed a bit awkward. And I used to make friends anyway in my head. So I had a whole plethora of imaginary friends. So when we used to go to the bog in the summertime, which, you know, the cousins thought was a very exotic experience, but we knew it was nothing but work. Um, I used to imagine that when we'd foot it and we build those, uh, they were like little houses, I used to think for bog fairies and the bog fairies used to live in them. And it sort of made the, it made the work maybe more, more desirable or easy or maybe 
Um, so I've written this poem called Bog Fairies and it's about me growing up and just going through that process. But I did pick this poem to read. It's from my a collection called The Radio Was Gospel because if it wasn't outside work, it was inside and the radio was always on. But it's a poem that actually has 10, 10, 20 bags in it because they were always <laughs> repurposed for um, for bag and turf. Uh, and weirdly in our, well, probably not weirdly, but they always smelled of cat urine. So that's also mentioned. So the 10, 10, 20 bags were recycled before recycling was in fashion. So it's called Bog Fairies. The heather like pork belly cracked beneath my feet. The horizon like nougat melted its pastel line at the heat edge, blue fading to white light. As we stacked rows of little houses for bog fairies, wet mulchy sods evaporating under our small pans. Crucifixions of dry brittle crosses formed a skeleton. My narrow ankles stood parallel to them, coarse and tough like the marrow of the soul, like the skeletons crucified under the peat. This turf will come good, my father said, when the wind blows to dry it. And we dragged ten, ten, twenty bags with the sulphury waft of cat piss along a track dotted with deep black bog holes and over a silver door like snails' oily trails leaving a map for the moon, for bog fairies to dance on the earth. And I imagined that maybe behind this door, once upon some time, old women sat in black shawls, bedding down irregulars and putting kettles of water on to boil for labouring girls. But I was gone. I was dragging comrades from the Somme. I was pulling concords in line with Swedish giants. I was skating on a lake in Central Park. I was crouched in the green at Sam's Cross. I was touring Rubber Soul at Hollywood Bowl, marching down on Washington with John Lewis. I sang Come As You Are in Aberdeen with Union Converse, petrol blue eyeliner and mouse holes in my big Connemara jumper. Because I was anyone but me and I was anywhere but here. We rushed to hurry the work before summer light would fade because animals need to be washed and fed and turf needed to be stacked. And all the talk of our youth was said in behind our hands because light was the ruler as it closed in around us like the dark on the workmen deep in the channel tunnel digging that night. The black light killed the purple heather yet I danced on the crackle in the dusk. I crackled on the dust in the heather. My dance on the heather turned me to dust. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. <laughs> You're welcome. That brings back memories in the bog, all right. It really is a lovely, lovely poem. I love that. Do you remember the bog? And there was a, there was a, we used to have like repurposed doors because we were great upcycling and we'd throw them across bog holes to pull the bags. And I always oh. imagined the doors because it's sort of like the, those layers of memory from the old house that's often on a farm that's oh. now, you know, derelict and you took doors down to bring to yeah. the bog to pull the, but it was tough work. Oh, well, we did grow up on the farm, like, do you feel like, do you see it changing around I you? Mean, you know, I, I mean, the road into the city is is where everybody's going. And it's a pity, really. Um, you know, I'm really interested in food produce and this sort of farm to table in a few steps. That would that that would really interest me. And I'd love to see something more, more incentives. And, and you know, I, I just think the West of Ireland has been a very hard place for people to farm and make I'm a living. Because the culture and agriculture, do you feel growing up in the farm did shape your creativity yeah I didn't realize how absolutely shaped I was by it and it wasn't always like shaped in a positive way there was there's a lot of cruelty on farms that kids are that are exposed to at a very young age um and you know I, I I've written a novel and I realize how much of that cruelty came out in that novel in a way that I didn't wasn't expecting actually um and for me I seem to be constantly going back to the to, to the land and the environment for answers because I think it's the only it's the only sustainable way we have and yeah absolutely create creatively hugely um both the good the bad and the ugly actually uh and again slightly like when I was a teenager and finished college and so on slightly embarrassed by it actually by it all didn't really wouldn't have admitted things like you know that there was a box cart or that we we dragged 10 10 20 bags or 
you know, that we, we it was a time when you could kill um, an animal and, and have it in a deep freeze. And that was the way that it, it worked. And, you know, my grandparents would have milked cows and we drank that milk. And I was slightly embarrassed by that because the world was modernizing and it just felt sort of utterly traditional. But I, I had the great pleasure of interviewing Margaret Atwood some just around Christmas, I think, or before Christmas. And we were talking about this and the value of, you know, land and, and what, what children can learn, learn from the earth. And she said, currency changes very quickly, you know, and, and there's that saying that, you know, they're not making any more land. But, you know, if you can sustain a family from from, from it, it's a powerful, it's a powerful asset, you know, and she was fascinating on the value of it and the value of outside and the value of, of what it can do for you creatively, but also, you know, how you could possibly etch out a living or, you know, in this pandemic, I suppose, being out in the countryside and having some space has never felt more wonderful in a way, you know, I, it, it's shown as a different way. So, yeah, it's like, like I said, I, I'll be honest and say slightly embarrassed and now um, quite proud, actually of it as a heritage of as my roots and and I I'm really glad it has seeped into the writing even the way people speak and the language that I would have grown up with um you know you're asked a lot as a writer what books were at home you know and I, uh, there weren't so many books as there were a lot of stories and it was a lot mm. of the orality of language and telling stories and I, I I think that that is that's priceless you know There is Elaine Feeney now. Th thank you. Just give us a little insight into how uh, growing up in the farm and culture can it changes your it affects the way you create creativity and all that. So just the importance of allowing people to actually raise families on farms and the small farms need to survive. You know what I mean, Rita? What did you think of that? Yeah, I think I think it's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that I'm going to bring Kieran in in a wee minute, but Kieran, when I were and I were chatting today about the numbers of farms there are in Ireland mm. and how that's dropped massively in the last 20 years or, or so. And how fewer and fewer people are being raised on farms. Mm. But actually it's a tiny minority of the population in Ireland who are now being raised on farms, which I think is very interesting for a nation of farmers is how we would have once thought of ourselves. But Kieran, can I invite you to come into the conversation? Um, and you you were very interested today. So I, Kieran was pulled in, Kieran knows nothing about farming or agriculture, generally speaking, and he was pulled into this madness to give us a kind of global perspective from the point of view of what, what are the forces currently at work in the world that are impacting here in Ireland in terms of farming? So, Kieran, would you tell us what you found? You went away and had a look at farming in Ireland. Tell us what you found. Well, yeah, just first of all, I'm delighted to be here and to say that, as, as Rita said, I'm somebody who comes in as a complete city ignoramus about the countryside, having grown up in Galway, but not really moved much further in the city. So look, I had to have a look today at what is the state of Irish agriculture and being a sociologist, I'm afraid I do a lot on figures. But when I look at it, I mean, it, it would seem to me Irish agriculture is in a crisis for the vast majority of people. Uh, so we're talking about 94,000 uh, farmers in this country. Uh, about 16,000 of the farmers are dairy farmers uh, who are on an income of maybe 60,000 plus. But then you look at, for example, beef farmers are an income of around, I think the figure was 9,000, which really seems shockingly low. Uh, and indeed, other, other, other um, forms of cattle, other animal raising is also quite low. Between 9,000 and about 14,000 is the income. But then when you look at what's happening in terms of the common agricultural policy, it is even more shocking. I mean, you have in Ireland, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that uh, often official figures will give you information, but they also hide things. So, for example, if you look at the number of farms in Ireland, which are over 100 acres, uh, they don't tell you how many is over 150 acres, how many is over 170 acres, but they will tell you how many are under 30 acres or 50 acres and so on. So all we know is there are about 4% of farmers uh, on over 100 acres in Ireland. But what's interesting is they are the people who get most from the common agricultural policy. So if you're on over 100 acres, uh, you are getting, on average, each year, 
as a direct subsidy from common agricultural policy and other subsidies, you're getting about 58,000 a year as a subsidy. If you're a farmer, however, on, uh, let's say on uh, 30 to uh, 50 acres, you're getting a lot less than that. So for me, uh, in many ways, I mean, I see this as the extreme end of a market orientation where Irish agriculture has now been told export your dairy to China, your beef around the world and so on. And that is going to have huge impacts on the vast majority of people who are working on the land. And we, one of the things we talked about, Kieran, is the I, so I love to know the idea behind the thing because there's always an idea behind the thing. So this, you mentioned the market and we hear all the time about the free market and you know, the market will decide. Can you explain to us what that actually is? And would you maybe explain to us this idea of neoliberalism, which I think is one of the best kept secrets in the world is that okay. we're not talking about it daily. Right. If you grew up in the 60s like I did and you talked to an economist, uh, at that time there was a character called Milton Friedman around. And he said, and by the way, in an interview with the Playboy magazine of all places, he says, we were regarded as complete eccentrics by our fellow economists and academics, right? Now, the ideas of people like Milton Friedman and before him Hayek are what dominate our world at the moment. And what is the, made, the big idea? The big idea is that if you want to be efficient, and the only way to do that is to compete on the market. Uh, there should be no state interference, uh, no public support. It should be a pure market based on competition and based on price competition. That's, that's the simple idea of neoliberalism. Now, what does all that mean? Well, if you look at it in terms of what's happening in Ireland, you can look at, first of all, there's the idea we must create a global market, either through Mercosur or through in, uh, investing, uh, sorry, uh, exporting to China and so on. And what happens here basically is people tell you the market's free and people tell you everybody's got a chance. In reality, because markets are based on competition, people get eliminated. And as a result, you find after a while, there is a monopoly or more precisely an oligopoly. In other words, a few very uh, big corporations begin to dominate seed production or begin to dominate, for example, in Ireland, the dairy industry or begin to dominate the beef industry. And far from you having competition, what in reality happens in real existing capitalism as against the theories and so on, you take, for example, Larry Goodman. I mean, Larry Goodman doesn't pay taxes here. He says he's a very proud Irishman. He locates his uh, companies in Luxembourg to avoid tax. He gets about a quarter of a million each year in EU subsidies. He has a, a huge farm, uh, I think it's called Braggenstown Farm, that if the price of beef is too high for Mr. Goodman's beef processors, he can draw on uh, uh, cattle himself from his own farm. And therefore, this is not competition. This is, if you like, a, a market that has produced big corporations, which then come to dominate uh, the small farmer. And that's, if you like, the economic uh, world we live in. And that's what that's what we're looking at in Ireland. So you have Sinead there. We talked about finance and a number of people in the in the chat and in the questions have been really interested in how Sinead manages to make a living. And it's just this this very thing is that it's not it's not a fair system. Would would that be right, Kieran? I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> it's, certainly, it's certainly not a fair, not a, not a fair system. It's also a very unequal system, right? And it's, I mean, look at we we live in a country that had some decent values, but increasingly, uh, the whole political culture is built on how can we make everything into a market. I mean, um, what twenty years ago, if you put a, your rubbish outside the door, it was collected by the. Uh, the local authority uh, worker. These days it's become a business. Waste is a business. And you get these business people who are now collecting your waste. And usually most of them, this is what happens in Ireland, most of them do not want to pay taxes in this country. They want to uh, put, have their headquarters in the Isle of Man or Luxembourg and so on. So the, the world we live in is about turning everything into a commodity, making everybody compete on the market, charging for as much as you can. So they try to make us charge for water uh, in the past before we beat them back. This is the world we live in. And uh, 
you have to try to do something about it. And I mean, obviously what you're starting here on a small scale in terms of offering alternatives is brilliant, but it's important that if you like, these are brought into a bigger movement that begins to challenge these sort of priorities. Yeah, and this is, we we chat, we come back to everybody in the questions and answers, but we chatted about this today, Kieran, about what do we do as a culture, as a society to address this? And you and I chatted about lobbies. And I think what you told me something I thought is really interesting and worth everybody knowing, which is you can look up who's lobbying the Irish government. Tell us about that, Kieran. Yeah, you go to, uh, I think it's called lobby.ie. I mean, because of public pressure, uh, it's, it's much, by the way, it's much better in America. In America, you can get much more detailed information, but at least in Ireland, they've been forced to acknowledge who goes into a lobby of government minister. So I was giving you the example today of a company called BlackRock, which most people probably don't know, but it's the big, one of the biggest companies in the world. It's a finance company. It owns, it's, it's behind a lot of the investments in all sorts of things. And when I look up lobby.ie, I find they've been in to meet the government minister 20 times in the last year. And they sort of give you a general statement of what they're about. But of course, we don't really know what they're going to talk about. Now, my, my point really to you was, I mean, you were saying to me, we need to build a lobbying organization. And I says, fair enough. But just remember what the word lobbying means. Lobbying means that you are talking as a social movement or as a movement to people in power. You're hoping that people in power will listen to you. Your problem is that those in power are also, to put it bluntly, they're in the pockets of Larry Goodman, they're in the pockets of the American multinationals, they're in the pockets of the big corporations. So your voice is listened to, but there are structures of power that are uh, uh, against you. And therefore, I I mean, I was on one of the, um, a number of the beef plan movement protests. I thought it was great. I thought that people were coming together. Uh, and if you like saying, listen, we are not just, we're not going to just be, going to be represented by the IFA because the IFA, in my view, is has advocated for the interest of the bigger farmers, uh, I thought you need to build a social movement and form allies uh, across the political spectrum uh, in order to enforce certain demands you want to try to achieve. So therefore lobbying by itself, you're simply talking to the power, but when you build a social movement and you unite people, then you force them to listen and you force them to make some changes. This is where, and this is where I think we have the massive untapped potential here in Ireland. So even though our farm community is getting smaller, every single person in the country eats food. 100% of the population eat food. And that's, I think, who we need to mobilize. It's the eaters who need to be mobilized um, because yeah. the farmers, the, the lobby just isn't just as big enough can i just come in there just to say about uh, hearing about you know because tall of you this event is also in connection with tall of you the farm organization i'm in and sinead's in and stuff and you know we're part of la via campesina which has been challenging neoliberalism for years and uh, fergal anderson one of the founders said that I, so we like we're hoping people would join tall of you not just as farmers but for as eaters that would you know generate a movement that we're not happy with this situation and challenge you know because social movements can create political space and all that you know so and i agree with you on the ifa kieran i i think talib you are the real ifa <laughs> okay. we can actually maybe try and ruffle some feathers by putting a few women in there and a few gays and you never know just just like throw the thing but um yeah absolutely fascinating really but uh will we take a few questions rita uh, yes absolutely for, let's take a few questions i mean um, there was one to Sinead there about she wants to talk about how she is making a living. I know because she's practicing circular economy, but it is about being supported, you know, by people in her area. She can explain that a bit, Sinead, how when you're doing your micro dairy, like you're delivering milk, like you do need support from people. If you didn't have customers, you wouldn't have an income. Uh, yeah, uh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always quite conscious of, sometimes we've reduced farming to, Actually, to be honest, we've reduced everything we've done to economics. And I think for us, you know, we've decided to farm not because we thought, Jesus, we'll be millionaires out of this. I can't wait to I can buy a brand new four by four and drive it all over the place. We did this because we wanted to live a particular lifestyle. And we decided, well, that lifestyle needs about this income. And how best can we do that income? Because we don't get any, you know, support from the Common Agricultural Policy. It's been mentioned a few other times. Um, we 
qualify for what's called the ANC, which is the Area of Natural Constraint. Because yeah, our geography has come in our favor, thanks to Mayo. But bar that, we get nothing else. So, you know, starting from that base, we knew we have to make relationship with Originally, I'll be honest, we thought that we would have to go further afield and um, because we had come moved back from an urban area to a rural area and you see that kind of localized food movement happening, I suppose, more, uh, more to the fore in urban areas. I thought we, we kind of assumed we'd be shifting milk to urban areas, but um, through social media and just talking you know, we've been telling people what we're, you know, what we want to do. Like our season has started officially um, and like we have a waiting list and people like every time I post something on Instagram, people are like, oh my God, there's a calf right. Is there milk coming soon? And I'm like, no, we feed the calf for a few weeks, then you'll get your milk, you know? And it's, it's, uh, it's building that relationship, you know, it's like us and the income and the lifestyle balance. I think for a lot of people, we're lacking community and we're lacking connection. And it's like the culture and agriculture direct food, you know, food from your farm is more than just eating local and being a, you know, sometimes local organic food can be seen as snobbish. It's more than that. It's a connection, you know? Like I know my customers by name, they know us. Yeah. And it's and, a community. And that I think it's a great thing to build community like. That's exactly the bit I think. And, you know, Karen was saying this, when, we, when we're looking at the market and we're looking at the product and we're looking at the all of that it's it loses its human scale mm. yeah but in fact it's the human scale that will save us definitely like if we were to try and compete with big dairy like that's just you know that was never going to be the case and um, you know we once had a friend that asked us oh but you know why would someone buy your milk um, when they could buy the same, you know, a litre for milk, a litre of milk for 90 cents in the supermarket. And we were like, well, you won't get our milk in the supermarket. That's the number one. So, you know, we've had to kind of build relationships in different way. And anyway, people have asked different things here and I've been answering them as best I can, but you know, what works for us won't work for everyone else. And I think that's the great thing about Talifio. There's so many different farmers doing different things in it. All we are, are, working examples of alternatives we're not a model we're not kind of you know we have a habit in agriculture to go this model works 100 cows on this amount of acreage plus this amount of nitrogen plus this 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 equals this it's not how it works you know we're just different examples of sitting back and kind of going here's my farm what can i do off it what's the income i need and you know can i do it differently and we're just examples and what you are is part of an ecosystem. So mm. if you think about it, we come back to what Leslie was saying about the soil yep. and how the soil is very is full of diverse life. And it's that diversity in the soil that directly impacts the diversity above the soil, mm -hmm. which you pointed out to so beautifully. And it seems to me that what you're doing and what other uh, tall of bio farmers and producers are doing is building an ecosystem of diverse production models, production methods, scale. And that seems to me to be a very healthy, like a healthy soil. Exactly. It's, it's a healthy bed for it. Yeah. I think if there's anything that you can learn from, I think once you step outside the bubble of industrial agriculture and you kind of go, right, I want to dip my feet and what's the first thing I can do? Just think on a biodiverse, don't think linear. We need to, you know, we're, complex being in a complex system. And unfortunately that requires us to think complex. And one of the best ways to, I suppose, think complex without getting lost in the science of it all is think about biodiversity and the more biodiversity we have and the more diversity we have in all approaches from soil to from multi-species pasture to the livestock we use, to the trees we plant, to how we get our food, the better it is. Very good. And so are there any other questions there that we should, Brita, have you pulled anything there that you think we should ask? Well, there was a, a good few I was asking, but a few of them have been answered already, a lot of the, but uh, it is definitely, I would say, you know, by joining like a place like Talavio, like if people came together, I think it, you have to be like local food networks. There's lots of 
networks all over the country. We do need a sort of umbrella to draw everyone together. And lobbying, I know it's, it's, it takes a lot of time and work, but I mean, they have to start somewhere. I feel like, you know, webinars like this now is really great because you see there's an appetite out there. Sinead can prove like, and, and Mimi Crawford now, they're saying there's great demand for the good products. And um, so it just needs to be supported on a level. And I suppose, because Sinead knew about citizenship, like there is the idea that, you know, if you're not a farmer, but you're, you're a citizen, every dollar you spend on food, you're saying, this is the, this is the system I want. And, you know, that's really very important, you know, so that's what I take from bringing everyone into it. If you eat food, you should be involved, especially mm -hmm. with that. Um, everyone should be able to talk about it around the dinner table. Um, but it's just kind of kept quiet, isn't it? A lot of it, but um, I don't know. I, I, there's no other questions. Anyone on the panel have a last uh, comment or anything you want to say, Leslie, anyone there? Yes, sure. Leslie, come back into this, Leslie, now and tell us, what did you think of all this this evening? Well, the, just there's a question there from Sarah Q in, in asking how hopeful are the panellists of being able to inspire larger scale change? And um, I would be extremely hopeful for the industry. Uh, change is happening already. Change is happening within within the industry itself in terms of the uh, the suppliers and the Department of Agriculture are pushing for, for lower levels of nitrogen to be used. The suppliers have re already reacted with supplying lower nitrogen levels in their fertilizer blends. Um, more and more farmers are becoming aware of soil health. Um, it needs to be um, it needs to be sped up rapidly, but uh, there is uh, there is a movement um, around the country, and there is a growing awareness of the importance of uh, education and soil health. But we do need we do need to, to to fast track it. But hope there's always hope, and I'd be very hopeful that um, Irish industry and Irish farmers can lead um, once we put uh, the information in front of them. Very good. Thank you for that. And Kieran, is there anything you'd like to to add to what you've heard or seen? Um, well, this first evening? of all, uh, thanks for inviting me, and I've probably learned far more than I've uh, imparted um, about the state of Irish agriculture. I, I do think we are. In an, I mean, I'm probably an eternal optimist, but I do think we are in an era of change. I mean, I think first of all. I think this the situation of intensive farming is causing so many problems in the world that even those at the top are beginning to make some changes like the way what, what Leslie mentioned there. But I also think there's a mood of questioning about where the world is going at the moment and whether we're in Mayo or Bangkok or you look at the farmers in India. I mean, people are coming together in big social movements. And by the way, the, what the reason why the farmers in India are protesting is because they want to withdraw the subsidies, turn it into a pure market, you know, crush people down again. So I think there's a mood of, for change in the world. I hope so. And I think that after COVID, we're going to see some signs of that, certainly. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear and really hopeful. So, Brita, do you think is it time to pull Hazel in? Yeah, Hazel is our graphic designer for the night, just doing a little doodle in the background and getting inspiration for all the speakers. So, hi, Hazel. Hi, Brita. Hi, Rita. Um, Hi, Hazel. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Here you are now, the two of you, our lovely host. Yeah, uh, like twins. I'll just go through. Um, yeah, really good. Good silent. Um, I'll just go through quickly what I've kind of captured here as a kind of summary. Um, just first of all, that image, um, Brida, that you saw of the, um, the blade of grass looking really sad there. And you were talking about your childhood. And I just love the image of the, the show Jumping Calf you had uh, growing up. Very good. Um, and the book, yeah, One Flower Revolution, Do Nothing Farming. I like that idea too. Let's do as little work as possible, if you can. Um, and you were talking about the, the old knowledge of like farmyard manure and how we've been led down this path, this chemical path with the 10, 10, 20. Um, and then Leslie Dwyer was talking to us about this and how, like to me, the most alarming thing here was that the genetic makeup of, of soil biology is being altered. Um, also, we talked about the soil loss and how maybe it's not so visible here in Ireland, but it is happening worldwide and we need education on this issue. Um, and, you know, we think we're not connected, but we are all connected to the soil, we're connected to plants and animals, and that's what it's all about. Um, so then we heard from um, Sinead Moran and uh, just some great stories about how, you know, people thought she, it was too high risk or a joke in different <laughs> situations. 
um, and the challenge of microfinance. Um, the advice there to dig a hole and smell the soil, great advice, lovely soil. And about how um, cattle will do the work of spreading um, diversity. Here's a plant being spread around the farm. Um, then we have the poem from Elaine. And I love this. Um, yeah, it was really beautiful. And just her journey from embarrassment to pride and how she was, you know, her eyes were kind of closed to um, to what was around her. Like she was experiencing the crunch. She remember the crunch and she was making up stories to make it more magical, but dreaming of other places. And then, you know, the magic came to her eventually in the end and she came back to the land. Mm. That was her journey. Um, so yeah, just talking then um, with um, Dr. Kieran Allen about how the biggest farmers benefit most from the cap, and you know the big idea here is efficiency, pure market competition, and here here we have the big players squeezing out the little guys. Um, here's a guy falling out here, and it's just you know this is unfair, is what he's saying. And then the the idea that we need to get a social movement going to lift people out of that situation. Um, to kind of yeah, build momentum and, and let our voices be heard. Um, and then back to Sinead, we were talking about how you know we've reduced everything to economic. What about the lifestyle we want um, and we want to create for ourselves? So that was my summary. Um, brilliant. Yeah, any comments there on that? Oh, brilliant and brilliant to have that. And Brita will make that available to everybody. She can say she'll send out an email to all of the participants um with the pdf of this so you can print it off and stick it on your fridge exactly and then just we have a donor box too for talib Bio and um the group as well for the regenerative agriculture in in mawali mawai mal i can't i can never pronounce malawi them. malawi that's it i have a tongue disorder a dyslexic uh, tongue i have one of them as well um, so uh, that Leslie will tell us a bit about more about that because um, just about the organisation, Leslie, that because um, tyranny. Dot org. Are you there, Leslie? Are you there, Leslie? Yeah, sorry, Brida. No, just the organisation that I just I just because Tall of your people can donate to Tall of your or they can donate to um, T T Tyrini um, organisation, the regenerative agriculture. Yes, it's an organisation that are doing great work in Africa, educating farmers, educating communities on how to uh, sustain, sustainably grow food in, in a regenerative system. And um, they've, helped, they've helped thousands of farmers in, in Africa change their system of, of agriculture to protect the soil, uh, educate themselves, educate, the, and then once they educate a village, um, they move on and they, and they get that village to help the next village and uh, and it's um it's it, it moves from there and it's a fantastic organization for um for i suppose uh, sustainable production in 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 the third world country who who um unfortunately uh, have a have a need for food and a need for sustainable production more so than ourselves well yeah thank you. I wanted to because I know in um, Ireland's milk or export, we export nitrogen percent and a lot of it goes to African milk powder to Africans, which undercuts farmers out there. So I quite as well. Any donations make time to donate half it to this organization, tirini.org. And it's all in the in the um, in email as well sent out. You can um, check it out. So thanks to all my speakers. Thanks to Leslie, Sinead, Kieran. Hazel, brilliant Sarah and, and Laura behind the scenes and of course the wonderful Rita Wilde for Ethical Eat and I'll put an email too to everyone with all everyone's details you want to follow up and thanks so much for a great conversation there was three over 300 people registered for this event so definitely we'll have another one there's an appetite out there so I just want to I, I'll just do a little verse before to say goodbye and it's called you have a voice so it's to everyone to you know that we have a voice so we can rise up together and uh, tell, say we want a better food system in Ireland. So thank you and good night to you. Thank you, Brida. You have a voice, a wonderful, beautiful voice, and you have a choice now to open your mouth Join Tolabio. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks very yeah. much. Bye -bye. And thanks to Lee and Feeney as well. She's out there. Bye. Good night, everybody, and thank Bye -bye. you all.
Oh my nice. God. Thanks, Frida. Thanks, Avilion. And Sarah. Right. Thanks, can... everyone. Yeah, yeah, thanks, off. Sarah. Thanks, Frida. And Hazel. Amazing. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Bye. Thanks, Avilion. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.